Hello, I'm Mark. I'm 58, British Druid, Bard, proud father of two wonderful 20-somethings, and a researcher of the occult and the natural sciences. This video is not sponsored by anybody or anything. No gold brokers, no super-duper survival flashlights, no nothing, unfortunately. But as a former fellow of the Chartered Institute of Bankers and a long-time activist against the globalist New World Order control system and their central banks, I faced minor notoriety ten years ago when I appeared on Edge Media. That was Britain's first TV truth channel. Detailing my perspective on the central banking scam and the political and religious indoctrination of society by a colossal global criminal class gaining the tag of the most dangerous man in England in the UK alternative media. A moniker I never sought, could never live up to, wouldn't want to, but will never live down. So let's just play with it. Granted, it is dangerous to challenge the central banks, uh, better known today as part of the deep state, and the consequences have been very real for me and others in the UK. But that wasn't the reason for the tagline. It related more to other insights and experiences which I preferred not to speak about on live TV, but did discuss with some of the producers, so I thought I'd do a series of short videos to share, in as few minutes as possible, some of them. Now, this first one is dangerous to those who don't want you to comprehend these facts and what they imply, and particularly your Luciferian overlords, for want of a better term, but it's also dangerous to you, the viewer, if you are not mentally prepared to look into the space mirror and see yourself as the world sees you. The word lunacy is rooted in the moon, and not by coincidence. Some of the concepts shown here have been misunderstood and even abused by sorcerers for centuries to mystify the subject, to create a cognitive dissonance, to control the mystified masses with pseudo-spiritual and religious dogma. And I hope that the additional data I'll show you in this presentation, uh, the result of my own work over and above that which is already out there, will serve to demystify the subject whilst hopefully pointing to some greater reality. In the moonlight the sorcerers are omnipotent. In the light of day though they become impotent. So you do need an open mind but not so open that your brains spill out, as someone once said. Ground yourself barefoot to the earth after engaging the moon and its numbers. The psycho-spiritual effects are real and can even be disturbing for some. This is why the moon has always played a key role in the occult psychodrama. A, a greater picture emerges from her reflected light, but that light itself can cast shadows upon your own ground, the real discovery you can make, I guess, is that you have a mind to find. I became actively involved with the Reality Group in London. That was a truth group, largely established by concerned mothers, and possibly the first truth group ever in the UK. I subsequently established Northeast Truth, another of the first truth groups in this one in Northeast England. Uh, I didn't want to call it northeast truth i i preferred reality northeast but others preferred the word truth to me this made the objectives elusive you know, more subjective and a whole lot easier for some to politicize and divide which they did in the 20 years prior to that whilst maintaining a career in the mortgage industry i found myself involved in environmental developments debate and research in scientific and academic, financial, political, religious, you know, occult, druid, Wiccan, and other esoteric circles. 
giving me a hard one insight into the political and occult manipulation employed within them all. It also gave me an interesting angle on the true nature of reality and those who manipulate it. I featured on Richard D. Hall's Rich Planet show, his second ever show, I think, and subsequent ones, uh, including a live question time. And I went on to produce my own show for live broadcasts and podcasts in the form of the Pierrot's and Fool's show, uh, in which I detailed aspects of my research, those which I believed had been overlooked or misunderstood in some way by the research and truther communities. Um, you'll find some of these on this channel. I helped David Icke promote his first gigs in the UK back in 1992-93, and this led to my involvement in the establishment of the Earth Foundation at David's suggestion, the purpose of which, beyond organising David's now famed London Wigmore Hall talk, was to gather research data from a variety of fields and to distribute it to those best equipped to use it pre-interweb days. I recall arriving in Milton Keynes years ago to appear on the legendary Theo Chalmers show, On the Edge, and I felt on the edge, I can tell you, feeling very much alone, almost destitute, holes in my jeans and the soles of my boots were super glued on. I was battered after spending all day on a mega bus just to get there, and some of you will appreciate that torture. The kindness of some folk was inspiring, though. In particular, Karen Franson, the producer of Eerie Investigations, who literally patched my jeans and fed me. Thank you once again, Karen. It was a, a freezing, frost-covered night under a bright full moon. I'd already appeared twice on the show talking about money, the central banks and the occult financial system operated by the elites some of which I explored with the Earth Foundation, but that's another story. So I took the opportunity to present one aspect of my researches into the science of the ancients, which I felt had been missed by those who study numerology, the, the pyramid and sacred geometry, something quite big. And I recall feeling driven to do it, though I was kind of reluctant to go into any detail because it wasn't my work but that of Dr. Peter Plichter, chemist and mathematician, and it certainly wasn't easy to do it in a live setup anyway. Moreover, producing the graphic of the prime number cross for that show had caused the computer I was creating it on to reverse the screen image, so it became difficult to actually make. Uh, I should say that the prime number cross is also referred to as the space mirror. So this effect was intriguing. It was even more intriguing when in the studio, as the producers tried to bring up this image for the live broadcast, the studio monitors also went into reverse image mode and upside down. This apparent glitch soon corrected itself and the broadcast went ahead okay. In it, I sought to encourage others to investigate what I considered to be the unification of all natural sciences, to search the internet to see that indeed there was nothing out there about it at that time. Today, there's much to find, and hopefully I played some small part in that. Either way, I'm heartened by the advances that some have made in this unification, and it is to them that I dedicate the new information I present in this video, not least Dr. Plichter himself, without whose insights I wouldn't have uncovered the astounding symmetry, uh, some of which I explain in this presentation. I guess this is the point where commentators religiously say, hey, don't believe me, go look for yourself, but, and here's the point, do believe me. I presume you will do what you will without me patronising you by suggesting that you don't. The numbers, however, are definitive, and nothing here is not provable or falsifiable, my personal speculations aside. Reality remains whether one checks it, verifies it, understands it, or not. All that said, this first video isn't even about the prime number cross, and that'll follow shortly, I hope. 
though I have given a couple of public talks which include the prime number cross and you'll find these on this YouTube channel if you're interested. One goal of this new video is to illustrate how the prime number cross is geometrically and mathematically connected to our reality in ways that I've not yet been able to show in a live presentation. If only because this colossal global criminal class are now finally exposed for the first time in an information age to the light of day. ISIS has been unveiled, dark to light. We are in a great awakening, uh, an awakening to reality which has the conscious engagement of so many people around the world regardless of race, religion, sex, politics, their will, intent, energy and spirit guiding a spiritual war against spiritual wickedness in high places, a great awakening to a fundamental resonance, a psycho-spiritual meta-narrative, if you will, that is uniting people in some fundamental and natural way. We are, indeed, drawing down the moon, insofar as this is the name of a Wiccan ceremony to summon the triple goddess, that is, the maiden, the mother and the crone, Look at the state of womanhood today in some circles. It's also the title of my original song, written after observing such a ceremony decades ago, recorded, produced and performed here for the first time at the end of the presentation. And if it's not, it's only because this presentation goes on a little longer than I might have planned for, but we'll see. If it's not there, I hope to release it within days um, separately. I do remain, after all, barred, and I thank you for watching and listening, and trust that some will see and hear. So, here is a graphic of the prime number cross. It's worth pausing and studying any of the slides if I go too fast, but I'd suggest that perhaps you watch the entire video, and then go back and take as long as you need on each image. That said, this image shows how the prime numbers all lie on eight rays of the prime number cross. All other numbers can be placed on this image, but only the primes are shown here just for clarity. All other numbers, incidentally, fall only into two categories, and they have their respective rays too, which in itself is quite astounding, showing a startling and simple geometric order in the system of whole numbers itself. But the order in the primes has not been seen prior to Plichter, though all mathematicians have sought one. And what are the other two categories? The ones not shown on this image? Well, they are the numbers which divide either by 3 or by 2. All whole numbers are simply either based on 3, 2 or 1. Which begs the question, what are the primes based upon? Well, they are the numbers based upon 1. They're a function of plus one and minus one. And by that, I mean they appear as twins, both sides of multiples of the number six. And you can take any multiple of six and apply a plus one, minus one function. Uh, in the case of, say, 12, this means the primes would be positioned at 11 and 13. Can you dig it, as they say? The number two is the number of doubling, and this is apparent to anyone. What many people don't realise, though, is that two is also the number of the octave, because an octave, in musical terms, is the exact doubling, or halving, of the frequency. Look at the number 81 highlighted in the image. Now, I call this number the pivot point between the third and the fourth dimensional geometry, and it's shown by Plichter to be the reciprocal number representing the entire system of whole numbers. That is, 1 over 81 equals 0 0.0123456789 into infinity. That's all you need to ponder for now, other than to notice how the geometry can also be used to graphically illustrate the cycle of the seasons relative to the astrological fixed stars, among much else. Astrology was, of course, a science of the ancients. Hopefully, even if you're a novice to this esoteric number theory, 
you might begin to get a sense of just what it was that people like Plato, Pythagoras, Newton, Tesla and Dr John Dee were seeking. They even stated openly that they were conscious of an ancient science based on numbers and consider that you still know their names today. Now let's look at the Templar cross geometry and the Great Pyramid. Realize that the Templar cross is a squashed pyramid. Imagine placing a finger on the apex of the pyramid on the left and slowly squashing it downwards until the apex meets the base level. And you will get the image on the right, which just happens to be the cross of St. John or the Knights Templar. A cynic would tell you that the image on the right has indented edges, but the Great Pyramid doesn't. But in fact it does, as many people know nowadays, uh, exactly as shown in the image on the left. The Great Pyramid therefore has eight sides. This is not disputed. So... The Great Pyramid actually contains the two-dimensional geometry of the Prime Number Cross and the Templar Cross and is therefore also resonant with the order of the Prime Numbers themselves. Now, I'm sure many of you already know that the Great Pyramid has been proven definitively to be a scale model of the Earth to a ratio of 1 to 43,200. And note the 432 sequence there for future reference in presentations to come. If you don't know this or are sceptical, just accept it for now and enjoy confirming it later. It's not really disputed, though some still deny it because their own pyramid paradigm has collapsed upon them in the shape of a Templar cross. There is so much out there, though, you don't need me to break it down here we just get bogged down anyway. Do realise as you watch this presentation that you are seeing 3D spherical geometry. The occulted science of an ancient civilization is in itself direct proof of the spherical nature of Earth and Moon. And you may begin to see why the counter-intel psyops like Flat Earth are so prevalent nowadays. Anything to confuse? Just saying. If there were at some time in the past a civilization on Earth which had an understanding of the physics of the universe and therefore consciousness itself, then it follows that they had a technology which engaged the psycho-spiritual aspects of consciousness. And we would probably consider this to be the fourth dimension, the other side of the veil in occult terms. It also follows that the technology they had would not necessarily be the same as our machines and systems today. Seems likely, necessary even, that they would utilize the natural resources like the living rock and stone and would tap natural energies of the planet efficiently. It would be based upon numbers and geometry. It would also be based upon the geometry of the pyramid shape itself. As contemporary science has revealed, pyramid-shaped cells in the cortex of the human brain, and it's revealed that the pyramid shape focuses energy much like a beam focuser, in the same frequency band, incidentally, used by modern-day Wi-Fi. So I don't feel it's too bold to suggest that this was a highly advanced civilization, but something tragic happened. This also happens to be the knowledge sought by the greatest minds of science by their own admission over centuries and by the occult wisdom traditions, secret societies and intelligence agencies throughout their respective histories. And when you look around the world and our solar system, you can see and sometimes even hear the remnants of this spacefaring civilization everywhere. So, what you will see here is very real and definitive. What you think it all means, of course, might not be. Now, an interesting fact to start with is that the mass of the Moon, relative to the mass of the Earth, is 181st. That's to say, the mass of the Earth is 81 times the mass of the Moon. And scientists are surprised that the Moon is so light, considering its relative size, leading to a speculation that it is at least partially hollow and some would say is not a natural object. 
do note, as previously mentioned, that 1 over 81 equals that number there. And when you see that number, it actually means 0 0.01234567891011121415161615 to infinity. But the decimal system doesn't actually show it in this image. So moving on to the moon and our local solar system, it's an interesting fact that the sun is 108 Earths wide. It is also 108 sun diameters distance from the Earth. And interestingly, 108 moons would fit exactly between Earth and the moon. Similarly, between Earth and the moon, all the remaining planets in our solar system fit exactly. Leading some to suggest that the best possible explanation for the moon is observational error. That is, the moon doesn't exist. The moon is bigger than it should be, apparently older than it should be, and much lighter in mass than it should be. It occupies an unlikely orbit and is so extraordinary that all existing explanations for its presence are fraught with difficulties, said Erwin Shapiro. Christopher Knight and Alan Butler... Uh, the famous Freemasonic authors, say the moon has astonishing synchronicity with the sun, both set at the same point on the horizon at the equinoxes and at the opposite point at the solstices. What are the chances that the moon would naturally find an orbit so perfect that it would cover the sun at an eclipse and appear from Earth to be the same size? What are the chances that the alignments would be so perfect at the equinoxes and the solstices? Ben and Rob, the hosts of the Edge of Wonder video channel, give an excellent summary in their video of the many occurrences throughout history of the number 108. From the Bhagavad Gita to the Bible, Sumerian, Greek, Hermetic and Egyptian writings, what they won't have realised yet is what's in this video. Perhaps you'd like to send them a link to ask what they make of it. I'll try to as well. Pythagoras had a whole cosmology based on the number 27, which is 3 cubed. Note that 1 over 81, as we've discussed, equals that number there, 0 0.12345, etc. And note that it defines the decimal system in nature itself. For example, there are only 81 stable elements in nature. Note the word stable. Now, Note that 81 is what is left when you subtract 19, that's the Islamic number of the moon, from 100. It is also the square of our highest number, which is 9. So 9 squared equals 81. It is also 3 times 27, a number we're going to be looking at in much more detail shortly. Clearly from that fact, you can deduce that 27 is one third of 81. Now recall the occurrence of the number 108 in our solar system and note that it is the sum of 3 to the power 3 plus 3 to the power 4. And consider that power 3 defines our three-dimensional reality and the power 4 represents the ever-present fourth dimension in which the three we know are contained much as the number 3 is contained by and within the number 4. Now, in playing around with numbers like this, it's always interesting to square numbers and to square root them and so on. Uh, it's always at that one level down or up that you find any encoding, if there is any. So, 108 squared comes to 11664. Now, that wouldn't appear to be relevant until you divide it by 81, that is. And when you do that, you get 144. Now that's a number that many who study these subjects will resonate with, shall we say. So, 108 squared over 81 equals 144, which is known as the harmonic of light. And we seem to be looking here at the geometry of space itself, where 3 space, for want of a better phrase, becomes 4 space. Like, perhaps twin plasma filaments twisting together 
or like, perhaps, a DNA double helix. Now, I've said that 144 is the harmonic of the speed of light. Visualize the circle being divided into 360 degrees. Mathematicians like Bruce Cathy mapped the Earth grid and observed that the most intelligent way to map three-dimensional spheres is in base 60. Now, that comes from our Babylonian heritage, and they first invented the zero and the decimal place system. And this means, just like the circle of 360 degrees, we can divide each of the 24 Earth hours into 60 minutes, and then divide each minute into seconds giving one Earth revolution, as shown in this slide, and a total of 86,400 seconds of grid arc. So using this as our yardstick for measurement, it turns out after a few Newtonian mechanics that the speed of light in free space in geometric terms has an angular velocity of 144,000 minutes of arc per grid second. The speed of light shown here at 299.792.458 meters per second. And notice that that is almost, but not quite, 300,000 kilometers per second. Now, which latitude passes through the Great Pyramid? Well, it's shown there. And notice how it is accurate to so many decimal places. But don't be confused by that, because what it's saying is that that latitude passes through the Great Pyramid. Uh, the pyramid is not centrally aligned exactly to that particular latitude. And this argument is used by the sceptics to shoot down this incredible coincidence. So while I'm pondering light, I have to say that from all of my research into this, and many agree, though others wouldn't, Light is not a wave, nor is it a particle. It doesn't travel at all. Waves don't have a speed. A wave is something that light does in a carrier medium. And there's no such thing as a shadow. A shadow is simply the absence of light. Tesla famously said that space has no properties, but I believe that he's wrong about this, and I'll show you this in this video. In fact, though, he was well aware of the role of numbers and number sequences and openly stated that if you want to understand the universe, you must first understand 369 and other such numerical operators. We'll go into this in future videos. He was unable then to see the prime number sequence. And I reckon were he alive today, he would agree that it is the template and the narrative of reality. Prime number space requires finite point-like particles. Mathematicians don't seek truth in any platonic sense, and they just believe in stuff they can measure, quantify, or count. But the Greeks distinguish between math and arithmos. That's numbers. And the difference is huge. The geometric resonance they seek is actually hidden in the numbers, not the math. Although, of course, it does appear at various levels by definition because of its root in the numbers. Light is a propagation of a perturbation. We don't see light, but only illumination, the impedance of that perturbation. It's only because of the electrical properties and the response of the medium to that field perturbation that we see at all. Do you begin to perceive an underlying symmetry? It's elusive, but if it's real, it may be found by exploring this number 108 a little deeper. We've looked at this already, in part, but 108 divided by 81 is 1.333. So 108 is 81 once you apply an expansion factor of one third. 108 minus 81 equals 27, and 81 divided by 3 equals 27. This mysterious 108 is linked to the more mysterious 81. And recall that 1 over 81 equals that number there. It is the reciprocal of the entire number system. And it is why 
Only 81 stable elements can and do exist in nature. The difference between 108 and 81 is Pythagoras' magic number 27, which is 3 cubed. Now, also notice that 81 reduces to 9 in numerological terms, as does 108 and 27, just for future reference. Now this number 27. If we accept that the sidereal year is 366 days, if you reciprocate 366, at the bottom of the screen on the right there you see you get that number which has 273 in it. Equally, if you put 1 over 273, you come back to 366. Notice the diameter of the moon at 2160 represents 0.273 of the diameter of the Earth. It's worth looking at this graphic and taking these details in. But do note that 2160 over 7920 is actually 0 0.272727 recurring that way infinitely. And you'll see this number again. Rounded up though, it is 0 0.273. And do consider that we are talking resonances here. If numbers were energetic in any way, the closer they get, the more they will resonate. The same is true of 3 over 11. It actually equals 0 0.2727 recurring. So let's look at this 2732 number in a bit more detail. Absolute zero, that is, zero entropy, or zero degrees Kelvin, is the point at which all energy movement ceases. Minus 273.2 degrees centigrade. Interesting. The sidereal month is 27.32 days, and that is the time the moon requires for its orbit of the Earth. At the end of this period, the moon assumes the same position in relation to the stars. A note that 10 sidereal months therefore equals 273.2 days. The Earth's orbit around the Sun equals 366 sidereal days. 1 over 366 equals that number there. The Earth and the moon are in reciprocal lock. We've seen that 1 over 366 equals 2732 if we ignore the zeros which are merely indicators of scale in the decimal system. When we reciprocate 2732, that is to divide it into 1, we get the following. 1 over 2732 equals 366. Again, ignoring the scalar decimal places. So, Earth and Moon are held together in a reciprocal lock involving 366 and 2732. They are mirrors of each other, the only variable being scale itself. The female estral cycle is 27.3 days. It's a proven fact that the estral cycle follows the true astronomical rhythm and not the cycle of the full moon to full moon, which is two days longer. The statistical average human gestation period equals 10 sidereal months, or 273.2 days. Do note that is a statistical average, the only way to measure these things. The moon's acceleration relative to the Earth is 0 0.273 centimetres per second squared. The radius of the moon is 0 0.273 Earth radii. Again, you've seen this in the original moon graphic, which you can go back to and check out at your leisure. The expansion factor of gas is 1 over 273.2. That is, gas expands or contracts by 1 over 273.2 of its volume for every 1 degree of heating or cooling. Professor Alexander Tom proved that ancient man used a megalithic yard of 2.732 feet in the construction of the global grid. And here is a key. The ratio of pi to 4 is 
1.2732. Let me say that again. The ratio of pi, which is 3.141 and is representative of circular and spherical geometry in three dimensions, the ratio of that to the number 4 is 1.2732. Now stop to consider the enormity of this fact and what it implies. Is 2732 perhaps the cornerstone that the builders rejected famously in Masonic history? Can you see the circle in this graphic? See how it is circumscribed by a square. Now look at the highlighted quarter. See how the corner flap raised up in three dimensions creates a pyramid. Not easy to show from a page but if you squint your eye you can see the pyramid. Now consider this. The ratio of the area of that corner flap to the quarter circle beneath it is, you've guessed it, 0 0.2732. Taking a left turn here into monatomic gold, which I'm sure some of you will have heard of, the starfire of the ancients, as it has been called. The 17th century philosopher, Arrhenius Philalethes, revered by Isaac Newton, Robert Boyle, Elias Ashmole, and other Royal Society colleagues of his era, produced a work in 1667 entitled Secrets Revealed. In this treatise he discussed the nature of the Philosopher's Stone, which was commonly thought to transmute base metal into gold. Philalethes made the point that the stone was itself made from gold, and that the philosopher's art was in perfecting this process. He stated, Our stone is nothing but gold, digested to the highest degree of purity and subtle fixation. It is called a stone by virtue of its fixed nature. It resists the action of fire as successfully as any stone. In species it is gold, more pure than the purest. It is fixed and incombustible like a stone but its appearance is that of a very fine powder. Sometime earlier, in 1416, the noted French chemist Nicolas Flamel wrote that when the noble metal was perfectly prepared, it made a fine powder of gold, which is the philosopher's stone. It's been found that the white powder of gold monatomic gold, described as the most exotic substance in the universe by some physicists, transmutes 44% of its mass into force space and can be transmuted back into powder form. Anyone can investigate this for themselves. I don't want to get bogged down here with it. Lawrence Gardner's books and YouTube lectures make a good starting point and the research of David Hudson. What I want to draw your attention to is this. Note that 56 over 44 equals 1.272727 recurring to infinity. What I am showing you here has apparently not been noticed by other researchers. You're seeing it here first. Stop to consider what is revealed by this coincidence. The mass lost as a ratio of the mass remaining is the same as the ratio of pi to 4. And remember that this simply can round up to 273 instead of 2727. Light appears to enter a complexified 3 space as it redimensions itself into the 4th dimension whilst losing 44% of its mass in the 3rd. Now Peter Plichter famously said it has simply been accepted in contemporary physics that matter is energy in quantized bundles. But because that word energy refers to electromagnetic energy, which is not capable of standing still and has no choice but to expand at the speed of light, the notion can be seen to be patently absurd. Now, there's an interesting resonance by turning even further left if Earth 
originally had a 360 day year which was subsequently extended to 366 sidereal days this implies that an addition to the mass of the earth was made perhaps due to a cosmic event of some type in the not so distant past perhaps this addition has caused earth's orbit to widen to the current position according to newtonian mechanics it would take an addition to the original mass equal to 0.00273 percent of that mass boom as they say thereby proving that avebury stone circle was constructed prior to the change in orbit now you can read Commons Beaumont in the, the book shown below and all of his other ones, including a Britain, the key to world history. Many have followed the works of Velikovsky, for example, uh, though Beaumont actually wrote about the catastrophe in our solar system before he did. I simply show in this graphic the respective pages in the book shown uh, referring to this. But the point to take on board is that amazingly and it's hard to see any link earth's orbit did increase and the addition to the mass of the planet to cause that particular increase is 273 anyway in the picture there do note that the temples of baal and ashtoreth referred to in the book uh, beaumont is referring to avebury there i do suggest that people read his books he came uh, to some startling conclusions, some of which were deemed um, so fringe that many people have overlooked him. But perhaps it's not so fringe at all. Similarly, another coincidence. You may have heard of the cosmic background radiation. Look at the background temperature they measured. 2.73 degrees Kelvin. <laughs> coincidence? Or did they perhaps just measure the harmonic resonance coming from earth's water as you will see that is possible but either way the implications are vast look closer at water particularly the fourth phase of water called easy water standing for exclusion zone i recommend you read the fourth phase of water by dr gerald h pollock in which he has identified and proven a fourth phase of water called exclusion zone uh, the proposal being that this actually establishes the charge gradient just by its very presence but you must go and read that now jerry mclaughlin from london who's provided some of the artwork you'll see either on this video or on the song video uh, she was in contact with dr pollock and through her i asked him to direct questions firstly i said an iron gradient may be seen as a fundamental process imparting a state to organic matter which we describe as life do you consider that the charge separation created by the presence of easy water h3o2 may be the key initiator to this gradient or may it be the nexus of physics and chemistry we call life itself he responded yes i think the charge separation associated with easy water is a fundamental attribute of life it may be the energy that powers what we do i know i'm out on the limb with regard to that one but perhaps it's worth putting out there and question number two said i have highlighted a natural constant in the number 2732 which when reciprocated is 366 among many occurrences of this number in nature for example is absolute zero your analysis of easy water reveals that it has a light absorption peak in and around the 270 nanometer frequency and i wonder if the peak might lay within a margin of error or measurement which includes and may therefore imply 2732 you can see what i was driving at there he responded no speculation there but i've got to admit that the 27 number comes up in my lab again and again earlier we found that muscles contract in a series of little steps with pauses in between the step size is always 
2.71 nanometers or integer multiples thereof. Perhaps you're onto something. So what is the significance of the numbers 108 and 144? We've touched upon it earlier, but here in Laser Revelation for any who study number theory and sacred geometry. In previous talks, I have shown how the first six orbits or circles or days on the prime number cross may be encoded in esoteric history as the six days of creation, just a speculation. But this seems feasible when one considers that the prime number cross represents mathematical and scientific proof for a unification of natural sciences, exactly as sought by Pythagoras and so many others over the millennia. It is also proof of what is known in esoteric circles, such as in Gurdjieff's teachings, as the law of three. A Professor Rupert Ley on Plichter's prime number cross said, the content is mathematically flawless. Everything that preceded Plichter from Newton to Einstein was only theory. Having found the mystery number 2732 present in many aspects of nature beyond those highlighted by Plichter, I reason that if it is the key to an ancient science, whilst also unifying all natural sciences in a mathematically perfect model, which it does, then surely it must be present in a significant way in the geometry of the Great Pyramid. Yet it had never been found, probably because nobody had any reason to look. So I looked and have shown you in this presentation that it is indeed present and in the most significant way, hidden within the slope angle itself, providing a proof that the slope angle was indeed 51 degrees and 51 minutes. So, what about 108 and 144? Recall that 144 is the harmonic of the speed of light, and recall also that 108 is the key to planetary scale and is present in ancient records, which, as I say, you'll find detailed in the Edge of Wonder video. Consider that they must surely be present in the prime number cross in some significant way if the two systems are linked as proposed, but they must be. Consider that what I'm about to show you is not mere theory. It's mathematically and geometrically perfect and is therefore subject to the logic of math. If it is disprovable in any way, the hypothesis fails. But it isn't. The numbers are present for all to see. And here they are. This is the prime number cross with all the numbers put on there. Note how the totals on each ring follow the series of odd numbers times 300. You can see that on the graphic. Notice how the first six rings total 10,800. What it's saying there is that literally starting at one and going around six rings, if you add up all the numbers on those rings, they total 10,800. They are the first 144 numbers. They encompass six circles on the prime number cross. The sum of all these numbers is 10,800, and that is, of course, 108, if you express it as a harmonic. So, 108 and 144 are, therefore, directly related to the order of the prime numbers, and there is the proof before your eyes. Each circle contains 24 numbers, and hence 6 circuits equals 144 the harmonic of light. Notice also that the prime numbers appear as twins either side of the multiples of six. And six itself is a unique perfect number being both the sum and the product of one, two and three. Now Dr. Plichter in his book, God's Secret Formula, the prime number cross, recognized that earth and moon are linked with the greatest degree of precision. And he stated the following. Because nobody was present to form these spheres with his hands, to bring them to the correct distance, and to start them at reciprocal orbiting numbers, the only explanation left is that nature is in itself intelligent, and we human beings, as self-reflecting creatures, are the self-realization of this intelligence. The other option, of course, is that the solar system has been terraformed by an intelligent life form, utilizing knowledge of the geometry of space and therefore life and consciousness itself. 
insofar as they have displayed their ability to engineer the necessary environment under which intelligent life can evolve. In other words, they were present at the time. You decide, but do realise that the options are not mutually exclusive. And on the lower right of this graphic, you can see two intersecting two-dimensional planes. This is what is termed x-squared, y-squared geometry. And that is the geometry of the prime number cross. The four-dimensional infinite space around a point, in this case, every point of intersection of the mirror, shown in the graphic, does not possess a z-axis, but only x-squared, y-squared geometry. It is proposed that this is the geometry of space. Now, back to the pyramid. I intimated earlier that researchers have perhaps missed something when it comes to the Great Pyramid. Ancient Egyptian texts lack any concept of an angle, but do have the seked, and this seked was a ratio that between half the base side of a pyramid and its height. That is the cotangent of the slope angle. The seced value of the Great Pyramid is equal to what you can see on the screen, a series which goes on forever using all the odd numbers, and Leibniz found this in 1674. You can read on the Wikipedia page about the seced, but I would ask you to note the gradient of the pyramid, detailed here as 127%. There's the 27 again. The slope angle and the exact height of the pyramid itself has been debated for centuries. But as those centuries have gone on, we've been able to pin this down quite accurately. There's some of the heights of the pyramid and the various calculations made. The Great Pyramid slope angle is closely one-seventh of a circle. That's 51.4 degrees. More exactly, though, it is given a, where cosine a equals 1 over phi, where phi is the golden ratio, if that means anything to you. So, the slope angle is 51, 51. Thus, phi and pi are integrated at this unique slope angle, and the natural cotangent of the slope angle is 1.273, as I shall prove in a moment. Proof that the intended slope angle was, always and actually, 51, 51. You've seen it here first. Proving also that the pyramid is a coupled oscillator in harmonic resonance with not only the Earth-Moon system, but also zero point itself. The harmonic resonance of the universe. And there it is in the numbers. This is Chambers' seven-figure mathematical tables. And going through there, you can do this online, of course, but I like the old analogue. There it is, 1.273. What were the chances of that? This number only occurs here and in the number directly below it. So the pyramid builders themselves clearly had great knowledge. This is not just some random building. And there, I would suggest, is not only some interesting evidence, but direct proof. The very fact that this number is the cotangent of the slope angle is almost a self-proving hypothesis that this pyramid was built to resonate. What it then did, you can speculate, but I would suggest it's becoming fairly obvious. Now, stretching any possibilities to breaking point here, it did dawn upon me at some point while I was studying this stuff that I wonder if you were to transcribe these numbers, the slope angle and the cotangent, being the two key figures, one of which is hidden, one layer down, but the two key figures of the Great Pyramid, what would happen if you were to assume that they were grid references on planet Earth. It would, of course, beg the question, which longitude would you use? Would it be where the pyramid is? Would it be another one? But 
that's open to speculation and it was an interesting little game to try. So just out of interest and make of this what you will, um, I'm not sure what I make of it, if anything, but this is where it would bring you to. This is the Isle of Dogs, London. This is 51.51 north. If you were to head west, it brings you to the Bristol Channel, uh, just off Porter's Head near Bristol. Again, just inland from there, of course. All of the interesting megaliths and Avebury and Stonehenge and so much more. Porter's Head itself has an interesting background and you'll learn about that actually uh, were you to read the books of Commons Beaumont that I mentioned earlier. Uh, if you go east, it brings you to what I consider to be a very interesting point because if you do a little bit of research into where this is, you will find that the, the land mass underneath uh, was clearly sunken when the North Sea filled in. Um, but this point would have been what could have been the biggest trading port on the huge island that was there at the time. This, many people uh, will know as Dogger Bank or Dogger Land. Dogger Bank, of course, is still further north than this, being the only bit that's still near the surface. Nevertheless, this was Dogger Land. And it's always interested me because in my studies, I believe that the pyramid builders came from Dogger Land, as did the Stonehenge builders. But that, of course, is another story. If we want to go much further east to a longitude of 29.979, so 30 degrees, basically, the, the pyramid, this is directly in line with it. Where do we end up? Well, that is precisely pointing at, can you work it out? That's Chernobyl. That is the waste area after the Chernobyl incident. And you find Chernobyl just down and slightly to the right of that indicator. So all interesting points, pure speculation, but I don't want any of you to lose sight of the enormity of the real data that came before that. Well, thank you for watching and listening. I hope some of this makes sense to you.